More than 65 million years ago, when dinosaurs ruled the Earth, you can bet there was a cloud of dragonflies buzzing around their heads. Dragonflies are amongst the earliest forms of insects. Really, they're like old technology. You know, it's a design that's been around from almost the beginning of insect evolution. But obviously, it's very efficient because they've hardly changed at all from then till now. So normally, when you think of dragonflies, you think of them as those aerial acrobats, the adult form. But, but really, most of their life is spent underwater. You know, it's the nymphal stage that a dragonfly spends most of its life in, in the bottom of some pond or a stream. And that nymph may live one or two years or even longer underwater as a predator. There's a whole other world goes on below the surface of the water. A world we don't usually see, but a world certainly worth investigation. But if you want to have a look at it, you really got to wade right in and catch a few things up get them in a jar and have a good look at them. And if you're lucky, you might find you've got some dragonfly larvae. Some of them have maybe been in that pond for two years. There'll also be things like tadpoles, fish, frogs, mosquito larvae, all kinds of interesting aquatic insects. When you bring a pond to your backyard, you bring a whole new system of life. when they're adults and they're hunters when they're young. As a nymphal form, they prowl on the bottom of a pond or stream and uh, they're looking for prey and they have a sort of a sliding jaw structure which can project forward and reach out and grab things effectively and then sort of ratchet it back in. They're lurking predators, you know, that reach out and grab things that are foolish enough to get too close. So they prey on the unsuspecting. A freshwater pond has to be one of the most fascinating places you can imagine. It's absolutely abuzz with life. Because it's an aquatic environment, you also see structures that are sort of unfamiliar to us air breathers. You know, they often have really interesting gills and siphon devices and things like that. It makes them very strange and otherworldly. You know, they almost look like something from an alien landscape, and I guess they are. Things like mosquitoes, they're living at the surface, but they drop down for uh, feeding or predator evasion and they do this great little wiggling motion to get down into the water column. You've also got creatures like caddisflies that are you know, really weird sort of creatures with very soft bodies, and to protect themselves, they actually build a house that they carry around on their back. They glue sticks and twigs and bits of rolled up leaf and everything all molded and cemented together to form this perfect little um, protective device. You're also gonna find all kinds of beetles. Some of them are diving beetles. Um, some of them hunt at the surface. All these sorts of things, of course, are fodder for dragonfly larvae. There's also a lot of creatures that will also make a meal of a dragonfly larva. Creatures like predaceous diving beetles and water scorpions and giant water bugs, all very formidable looking creatures. You know, with a dragonfly nymph, it's uh, essentially a race against time. You know, they have to grow as fast as they can to be able to reach the adult stage. In the meantime, they've got certainly no shortage of enemies that can still easily make short work of them. You 
not very many of the eggs that are hatched actually grow up to be dragonflies. Most of them get picked off their food for somebody else. That's the role of most creatures out there, to be food for somebody else. If you live underwater all the time, the way you have to get your oxygen is you have to get it right out of the water, so you really do have to have gills. In the case of a dragonfly, by having the water draw in one end of the abdomen and expelled out the other, it really is like a jet propulsion system. That allows them to make a quick escape from a predator. And then they just kind of disappear again. The extended period of feeding and growing for dragonfly nymphs finally culminates in the emergence into the adult form. Physiologically, this is a very traumatic moment. A nymph has to leave the water to emerge as a flying adult. Everything has to change instantaneously, from how they get around to how they breathe. It's a very drastic change. It's an awful lot like being born. They're still not ready to go. The wings have to dry out, the body has to harden before they're ready to fly. And that's quite a process. Dragonflies are very ancient machines, pre-programmed to fly. So almost from the moment they emerge and their wings are dry enough, they're able to fly like aces. Dragonflies are incredible to watch. They can go up to 30 miles an hour and their aerial acrobatics would be the envy of any test pilot. Now what they have to do is lead a very, very different life. They have to be able to snatch prey out of the air, they have to be able to spot them over long distances. They become almost exclusively visual predators, and visual predators in a three-dimensional world that's very different from the one underwater. To be successful, dragonflies have to outgun their prey. One of their advantages is their huge eyes that allow them to see more detail than almost any other insect. And they're mounted on the side of the head so they can see up, down, side to side, in almost every direction. Then to be able to outfly and outmaneuver their prey, they have to have wings that are specially arranged so that the front wings are mounted separately from the back wings, so they can independently change the angles of the wings. This gives them the ability to hover, fly straight up, straight down, straight side to side, or even fly backwards. Furthermore, they've got this long abdomen that acts as a stabilizer or rudder, which gives them superb maneuverability so they can catch their prey on the wing. These creatures have magnificent levels of control. Thank <laughs> you. 
Damselflies are like the delicate cousins of dragonflies. You can distinguish them when they're at rest because damselflies have much uh, narrower wing surfaces. And when they rest, they actually fold their wings over their back, whereas dragonflies have their wings extended and forward, sort of like an airplane. Damselflies are also very different to watch when they fly because it's more like the motions of a butterfly. The wings of both dragonflies and damselflies are transparent. They don't have any scales on the surface like butterflies and moths do. They're very, very thin structures, but they're rigid, and what you can see is a fairly thick set of veins that move all through it. And this interconnected bridge work, if you like, of veins really makes the wing more rigid. On a hot summer day, you can see all kinds of dragonflies patrolling around the pond. And it's nice to have them buzzing over your head because although they'll eat almost any small fly insects, they particularly like mosquitoes. An individual dragonfly might eat a couple of hundred a day, and that makes them pretty effective mosquito control. And the way they do this is by snagging them out of the air and eating them on the wing. Dragonflies eat, for example, all kinds of flies and butterflies. They'll eat small moths and mosquitoes. They'll eat almost anything that flies, as long as it's not too big. Both dragonflies and damselflies have a weird habit of perching. And if you sit there and watch one sitting on its perch, you can see its head turning, swiveling, as it searches for females to mate with or potential male competitors, you know, other males that might want to compete for his territory. But he's also looking for prey. So from their perch, sometimes a, a prey item will move through their visual field and they'll dart off the perch and snatch it out of the air. Dragonflies and damselflies, because they're in the air nearly all the time hunting, are subject to predation by all kinds of predators. Uh, some species of birds, for example, flycatchers, and that'll just snatch them out of the air. But also, as soon as they get near the pond edge, they're uh, easy prey for frogs. Frogs are almost complete opportunists. Um, if it moves and it's close enough, they'll eat it. You know, when the day ends, essentially, all they do is they look for a favorite perch. A uh, dragonfly just sits there quietly and uh, hopes that nobody notices. So at nighttime, they can be fairly vulnerable, but because they're not flying, things like bats aren't likely to get them. Because they're up on stalks of plants, a lot of predators really can't get up there. And of course, visual predators can't see their wing patterns or anything at night. So, you know, they're reasonably secure because they just don't move. For the first few weeks after they emerge, dragonflies don't just hang around the pond. Even if you don't have a pond in your garden, they will be in your garden because they are able to cover a fairly large territory. They're powerful flyers. They can go for miles. And of course, if you have a good garden with a lot of insects, and to me that's a sign of a good garden, lots of insect activity, then you will have dragonflies. They're everywhere. 
they'll find gardens particularly to their liking because a garden has such a diversity of plants and therefore a diversity of insects. It's like a smorgasbord for dragonflies. And dragonflies are usually hovering higher above your garden and they'll be picking off things like uh, horseflies and deerflies. On the other hand, damselflies in your garden will often be very low in the vegetation, poking around looking for small insects. So it might be winged aphids or winged ants, midges, and small flies. If you want to guarantee that you're going to have lots of damselflies and dragonflies in your garden, the secret is not only to give them habitat for the food that they eat, but also give them a place to breed. By having a pond, you're going to guarantee yourself a bigger population of damselflies and dragonflies. The kind of pond you need to attract dragonflies and damselflies doesn't have to be too spectacular. It can be fairly small. It should be deep enough that it doesn't freeze right to the bottom so that the nymphs can survive the winter. The other thing is if you want real success with dragonflies, you have to try to keep back the predators like fish. If you've got a couple of big fish in a small pond, you know, they're pretty much going to pick it clean. It's also important to have lots of vegetation right near the edge, you know, partially submerged vegetation or even uh, vegetation that grows on the edge of the pond and dangles down into it so that the dragonfly nymphs can crawl up those stalks uh, to transform into adults. It's important to have lots of vegetation anyway in a pond because the more vegetation you have, the more prey there's likely to be. You won't have lots of other forms of life unless you have lots of plant material. The flying adult stage of a dragonfly's life is actually quite short, usually only six to eight weeks. And the first two weeks are spent out in the gardens and fields eating like crazy to build up the energy reserves for the next step, the return to the ponds for the all-important goal of sex, passing on their genes to the next generation. Males are usually territorial, so they try to ward off other males from the best territories. And then the females show up at the ponds and they're dazzled by all these strikingly handsome males with magnificent territories, and uh, when they finally you know, decide to accept one and they'll mate, you have to be a little envious of them. They can do their mating while they're flying. The whole thing usually takes only a couple of minutes. That part is a little harder to envy, but then they break off, and uh, um, she's not interested in him anymore. Uh, she's got the sperm she needs, and she goes about laying her eggs. Now, when it comes to egg laying, a dragonfly has to do that near the pond because the eggs have to be able to hatch as nymphs that can enter the water. So she either can lay the eggs on the surface of vegetation, right just above the water surface, or in many species what she'll do is directly deposit the eggs one at a time into the water. Of course, the problem with having to lay your eggs one at a time in the water is that it puts you in close contact with lots of predators. There may be fish lying in wait just below the surface, ready to snap them up, or there could be frogs waiting to grab them out of the air. Now, the male actually still has some interest in the female at that point, because what he'd rather not see is for another male to mate with her now, because that would put his sperm in direct competition with the other guys. So at that point, he'll still hang around her and try to keep other males away. And I don't think there's any special rules that females have about being faithful to one guy or anything. I don't really care. So she may lay a bunch of eggs and then move on. When damselflies mate, it's often also a very complex sort of courtship behavior. Male damselflies go through all the trouble of defending territory because they want exclusive rights to the mating opportunities that that presents. So often in the process of mating, what happens is other males will try to get in the act and it's the job of that mating male to try to keep them away.
And in fact, even as she's laying the eggs, he has to make a point of really fending off any other males. So he'll go to a great deal of trouble to keep everybody else away and her in the business of laying those eggs after he's fertilized them. Well, once they finish laying eggs, they don't last very long. All their activity is just totally temperature dependent. In the late fall, you might have whole days where nothing happens, you know, they just don't move. When you've had a light frost, for example, you can often find them sitting there absolutely motionless and sometimes even frosted over doesn't kill the dragonflies, the dragonflies just don't move. Uh, now eventually it just gets to be too cold, they can only take so much cold. Once the temperature gets down to four or five degrees below zero, then they just die. However, below the surface of the pond, crawling around, lying in wait all winter, are next year's dragonflies.